I seem to have given myself the job of trying to persuade you that number theory can be addictive, so let's see how I get on. Uh, so what is number theory all about? Uh, well, for me, number theory is all about the whole numbers, uh, maybe particularly the positive whole numbers. So I'm interested in looking for properties of the whole numbers, trying to find some, something about the underlying structure of these numbers. What are these properties of the integers that we can look for and explain? Um, so this was as many as I could fit onto my screen. It's very friendly, kind of familiar numbers, I hope. Um, so one of the things that we can do is look for uh, particular sequences of positive whole numbers, of integers that we might be interested in. So here's a sequence that I'm sure many of you are very familiar with, the prime numbers. So these are numbers whose only factors are one in themselves. Um, so I've colored those in blue there for you. Uh, please note one is not a prime. Uh, that's not because of some interesting philosophical reason or some kind of pedantry about what it means to have two factors or any of that. It's because we're mathematicians, we get to make the definitions. So these definitions aren't given to us on a stone, right? We get to make the definition, so it's our job to make sensible definitions. And it turns out that the sensible definition is to say one is not a prime. So here are some prime numbers. Um, and again, this is how many I can fit on the slide. So it's kind of easy to look at these numbers and see some patterns amongst them. But as a mathematician, I'm not really interested in properties of the first 25 primes, properties of numbers up to 100. I'm interested in what happens below this slide. What would happen if I'd been able to fit more on, if the floor hadn't got in the way? So what I'm interested in is trying to detect interesting properties but then to think about, well, would those continue beyond the bottom of this slide? If I can see a pattern, does it continue? So that's the question that I'm always kind of asking myself. So a couple of things we might want to know about prime numbers before we got, start getting too involved. So one of these things is, how many of these things are there? How many prime numbers are there? Are we, are we going to run out of prime numbers at some point? If I had a very large slide, would I get to the biggest prime number? And then from on, then on, all the other numbers wouldn't be prime, they'd be composite. Um, it's quite an important question, actually. I mean, there's a sort of difference between having finitely many of these things and infinitely many. And it turns out that there are infinitely many prime numbers. So we're not going to run out. Our supply is just fine. So this is a theorem. This is a mathematical fact. This is not something that I sort of think is probably true. This is something that I know with absolute certainty because I can prove it. I'm not going to prove it for you right now. I suspect that quite a lot of people here maybe have seen a proof that there are infinitely pr many prime numbers. If you haven't, I recommend you go home and look one up on the internet or in a book or something. If you have seen a proof there are infinitely many primes, then you should go and find another one. Because there are lots of prime proofs that there are infinitely many primes, and each one tells us something slightly different about the prime numbers. What else might we, not, might we want to know about these prime numbers before we get going? Well, why am I so excited about prime numbers? I mean, they have this kind of interesting property that somehow we can't split them up. But what is it that makes prime numbers so important? Why, why do mathematicians, number theorists, get so excited about prime numbers? And it turns out that they are somehow the building blocks of what, everything else. So I take any positive whole number greater than one, and I can write it as a product of prime numbers. I can factorize it. And I can do that in just one way. So I'm saying two things in this statement. I'm saying that I can factorize it, and also that there's only one way of doing it. So that's really important. Um, actually, I've said essentially unique. What do I mean by essentially unique? Well, there's this sort of silly thing that I might write the factors in a different order. So someone this side of the room might factorize 12 as 2 times 2 times 3. Someone this side might factorize this as 2 times 3 times 2. I think we'd all agree that we've got the same factorization there. So, so essentially me unique means really unique, we just might write the factors in a different order. And this is a really good reason for one not to be a prime number, right? If one's a prime number, then I can factorize 12 as 2 times 2 times 3 times 1 times 1 times 1. That would be a rubbish thing. I mean, that's not an interestingly different factorization. So that's a good reason to define one not to be a prime number. Um, and this uniqueness of prime factorization might seem kind of obvious because we're all kind of familiar with this. We're used to playing around with these numbers, maybe at primary school, and working out factorizations, working out how we can split these things up. And, and we don't worry that the person next to us is going to do it and get a different answer unless we've got it wrong. But this uniqueness actually isn't obvious. This is something that requires proof. It's a theorem. It's not an obvious fact. It's a thing that we have to prove. And it turns out to be really important. So there are all sorts of things that are true because of the uniqueness of prime factorization.
that if, you know, if, if private factorization unique, weren't unique, the world would be a different place. So again, I'm not going to prove this for you now. I encourage you to, to go and look up a proof. What I like to do is, knowing these things about primes, we're not going to run out of them, and they're somehow important because they're the building blocks of everything else. I'd like to go back to these primes, so here they are, and think about what we might be able to say about these primes. What interesting things might we notice? Um, so one of the things I notice is that some of these primes are quite close together, some of them are a long way apart. So I can find a really big gap, actually, between 89 and 97. Look, there's loads of numbers in between the aunt prime, whereas 17 and 19, or 71 and 73, are really close together, right? They differ by just two. So one question I might ask myself is, do the gaps between these primes kind of keep getting bigger? Do they become more spread out? Or might I keep getting these pairs of primes that are really close, that differ by just two? And on the basis of this information, really, we haven't got very much to go, and it's very hard to predict what happens. Actually, there's this big gap from 89 to 97. If I'd managed to fit another row in, you'd have found that 101 and 103 and 107 and 109 are actually all primes, so there's some more bunched up together. So this is a really good question. Are there more of these pairs of primes? Are there lots more? Infinitely many? Actually, it's a really good question. I don't know the answer. So this is, this is an open problem. So the, the conjecture, mathematicians think it's probably true that there are infinitely many pairs of these primes that differ by just two, but we don't have a proof. It might turn out to be false. I really strongly believe it, but as a mathematician, I'm not satisfied because we don't have a proof. So if you are bored by the rest of my talk or something, you could treat this as an exercise. So... Actually, we can take these prime numbers, these quite familiar things, and we can ask a really innocuous question, and it's really difficult. I find that quite intriguing. For me, that says there's something really interesting going on. There's clearly some underlying mathematics, some mathematics that's making this all work, and I'd love to understand it. So what else might we do with primes? Well, we could try adding prime numbers. That might be an interesting thing to do. So here's one I prepared earlier. What I've done is I've taken the primes... Um, and I've added three, which is a prime. So what I'm really interested in is what happens when I add together two prime numbers. So I'm just showing you a halfway stage in my working out. So I've taken the primes and I've added three. I've sort of ignored two. I haven't included that because it's the only even prime. It's sort of a special case. So let's sort of temporarily forget about two. I'm interested in adding odd primes. So what happens if I add together pairs of odd primes? These are the numbers that I can write as the sum of two odd primes. It's kind of surprising, isn't it? I mean, that's a very pretty pattern. So I notice two things about this pattern. I notice lots of empty columns, lots of numbers that it seems we can't write as the sum of two primes. And I notice lots of full columns. So it looks like this sort of either a column is empty or it's full. But this is just the numbers from 1 to 100. This is just thinking about which of the numbers from 1 to 100 can I write as a sum of two odd primes. Who knows what happens beyond the slide. So let's think about those two things. So if I take two odd primes, could I possibly end up in one of these apparently empty columns? Well, actually, if I just add two odd numbers, I'm going to get an even number and already... I can't end up in the one column, the five column, the seven column, or the nine column, or three column. So those columns are not just empty here, but they're empty forever. So that's a proof, if you like, that those columns really are empty. And my other observation was that the blue columns, it looks as though they really are blue. It looks as though all of the... Well, it is the case that all of the even numbers between 6 and 100 can be written as the sum of two odd primes. It's kind of... Surprising, if you haven't seen it before, I think. So, here's the conjecture. The conjecture is that every even number from 6 onwards can be written as a sum of six primes, of, of two odd primes. So this pattern continues beyond the slide. So this is conjecture that uh, Goldbach wrote, made in a letter he wrote to Euler. I've put the dates of Goldbach there. You can see this goes back a long way. This is a conjecture. We believe this is true. We do not have a proof. So when you've sorted out the twin prime conjecture, this is exercise two. Uh, it's good to know that there are these kind of problems that we can all understand. I haven't had to 
teach you a 24 lecture course in university level number theory, we all get the problem. But actually, it's quite difficult. There's some really challenging mathematics going on here. So, what I learned from this is that prime numbers are really interesting, they're really intriguing, they're quite difficult. So let's look at another sequence, another of my favourite sequences of numbers, and think about some of the same types of questions, see what we can do with those. So, here's my next uh, sequence of numbers. So I'm sure that you recognise these numbers. These are the square numbers, so 36, 6 times 6, 49, 7 times 7, so on. Not quite as many of them up there as prime numbers, there are fewer of them here. Uh, Another really interesting sequence of numbers, though. So, what interesting things might we find going on here? Well, are there pairs of square numbers that differ by just two? We could ask that same question we did for the primes. Well, uh, no, because the squares really are getting further and further apart. You know, you sort of stop and think about that. So, that's not the right question to be asking with the squares. But we could try adding together two square numbers. So, when we added together two odd prime numbers, we found we seem to get all these even numbers. What happens if we add two or two square numbers? Might be odd, might be even, who knows? So, I've done this for you. So the blue numbers are the squares, which we've seen before. The yellow numbers are the sums of two squares. Uh, actually, for me, zero is a square number. So for me, any square number is also a sum of squares. So 49 is seven squared plus zero squared. So I'm including these blue numbers as sums of two squares. I've just left them blue so that we can still see where the squares are. So when we did this with the primes, they all lined up neatly in columns. So there was this really striking pattern and we could make a very clear prediction about which numbers were sums of two squares and which of, of two pr odd primes and which weren't. I'm not quite sure, sure what the pattern is here. I'd love to be able to predict which numbers are sums of two squares and which aren't, because clearly some are and some aren't. But at the moment, the best way I've got for deciding is to go and try it, kind of boringly and tediously working out lots of squares and saying, oh, do they add up to give this number? Um, I can't see any patterns here. Um, but why have I lined them up in this grid with... 10 columns. I've lined them up in a grid with 10 columns because we're all kind of used to 10 by 10 squares and maybe we've sort of played with them at school and we've got 10 fingers and it all feels very natural. But there's no sort of terribly obvious maths reason why this should be the right thing to do. Maybe we should try a different number of columns. Like 9, for example. So the same numbers are coloured in. I've just shuffled the grid so that it's now got 9 columns. Um, so can you see anything interesting here? Um, well, it looks as though there might be some empty columns. Still sort of feels like a bit of a mess to me. If I tilt my head on the side, I can kind of see some diagonals running from the bottom left to the top right. Seems like there might... That kind of diagonal thing makes me think that maybe, maybe nine columns isn't the right number of columns. Maybe I should try have eight columns and then those diagonals sort of line up. So, right, eight columns. So same numbers coloured in, but now lined up. And now, to me, it seems like they're starting to line up much more neatly. I can start to see some patterns. I, I could make some predictions. So one prediction I could make about what happens beyond the bottom of the screen is that the three column, the six column, and the seven column are empty. That seems like a kind of compelling conjecture on the basis of this information. And then, and then it seems like the other columns have some numbers that are sums of two squares and some aren't, and I'm not quite sure what to do with that yet. Um, but maybe we should think about the three column, the six column, and the seven column. Are these columns really empty? Is it really the case that these numbers can't be written as the sum of two squares? Well, what does it mean to be in the three column? So numbers in the three column, if it's three more than a multiple of eight. So there's 67 lurking there in the three column. It's three more than 64, which is a multiple of eight. I'm sort of wrapped around. So what I want to know is, can a number that's three more than a multiple of eight be a sum of two squares? That's the question. Well, maybe let's, let's take a step back and think about where the squares are in this grid. So if we look at the squares, which I've conveniently left blue, they're in the one column, the four column, and the eight column, it seems. So it looks as though square numbers are a multiple of eight, one more than a multiple of eight, or four more than a multiple of eight. Is that really true? Does that really continue? Uh, yes, it does, actually. Um, if you don't see that straight away, that's fine. You can go and do a couple of lines of algebra later on to convince yourselves that it really is true. So it's not too difficult to check. So the square numbers are 0, 1, or 4 more than a multiple of 8. 
So now I can think about what happens when I add two numbers that are 0, 1, or 4 more than a multiple of 8. That's not too many possibilities to check, so I'm going to do it now and say it very quickly. And if you're awake, you can see whether what I'm saying is right. So if I add two multiples of 8, I get a multiple of 8. So I expect to find some sums of two squares in this right-hand column. If I add a multiple of 8 to a number that's one more than a multiple of 8, I get something that's one more than a multiple of 8 in the left-hand column. If I add something that's a multiple of 8 to something that's four more than a multiple of 8, I get something four more than a multiple of 8. There they are. Nearly there. If I add two things that are both one more than a multiple of 8, I get something two more than a multiple of 8. That's that column. If I add something that's one more than a multiple of 8, something that's four more than a multiple of 8, I get something that's five more than a multiple of 8. There you are. And if I add two numbers that are four more than a multiple of 8, I get a multiple of 8, actually. So the crucial thing there is not really what I said so much as what I didn't say, because at no point did I say, and we get something that's 3, 6, or 7 more than a multiple of 8. So if I add two numbers that are 0, 1, or 4 more than a multiple of 8, I can't possibly end up in the 3, the 6, or the 7 column, in kind of the same way that if I add two odd numbers, I can't possibly end up in an odd column. So those columns that seem to be empty really are empty beyond the screen. Proof. What the heck's going on with the rest? Uh, why is 33 not a sum of two squares, but 41 is? What's, what's going on? Um, well, it turns out that quite a good thing to do here is say, well, let's, not, let's, let's warm up. Let's not think about which numbers are sums of two squares. Let's think about which primes are sums of two squares. Let's specialize. We know that these primes are somehow fundamental building blocks. Maybe if we can understand what's going on for primes, that will help us understand the problem overall. So... I've now made all of these sums of two squares blue. So those are the sums of two squares. These are the primes in yellow. So we've seen these primes before. I haven't shown them to you in an eight-column grid before, so you haven't seen them looking quite like this, but there they are. Hopefully I haven't got them wrong. So what I want to do is put those two on top of each other. So sums of two squares, primes, I'll overlay them, see what happens. So blue numbers are sums of two squares. Yellow numbers are primes, and obviously, when you combine blue and yellow, you get green. So, what is this telling? So, I'm interested in which of the primes are sums of two squares, and which aren't. Uh, so, two isn't the only even prime. It's sort of a special case. It's kind of easy to check the two as a sum of two squares. So, let's not worry about two. Let's think about odd primes. Which of the odd primes are sums of two squares? Well, we already know that if... You've got an odd prime, and it's in the three column or the seven column, then it isn't a sum of two squares, because we've already checked that nothing in those columns is a sum of two squares. What if we take things that are primes that are in the one column or the five column? Well, it looks suspiciously as though they're sums of two squares on the basis of the data so far. So all of the possible yellow numbers in the one column and the five column are actually green because they're primes and they're sums of two squares. So it looks as though, for primes, there's quite the clear split. If you're 1 or 5 more than a multiple of 8, then you're a sum of two squares. If you're not, then you're not. On the basis of this evidence. But I'm not, I'm not kind of leading you up the garden path there. This really is a theorem. So I'm sure that lots of you have heard of Fermat. Uh, Fermat is pro famous for not proving Fermat's last theorem. Um, but he did lots of other stuff as well, and sometimes he did actually prove the things that he said he proved. Um, so this is a theorem due to Fermat, and he says an odd prime number can be written as a sum of two squares if and only if it's in the one column or the five column. He didn't have the benefit of my handy grid with columns, so he didn't say the one column or the five column. He said one more than a multiple of four, but it's the same thing. So if and only if. So we've got a really precise rule. If I give you a prime number, you can tell me really quickly whether or not it's a sum of two squares, you say, oh, what's the remainder when I divide by four? Is it one? Yes, it's a sum of two squares. Is it three? No, it's not a sum of two squares. So for primes, we've got this really nice way of deciding whether a number is a sum of two squares. Um, our goal was to try to find a way of finding for any number whether it's a sum of two squares. And actually, I'm not going to do that right now, but... Once you've understood what's going on for primes, once you've proved this theorem, and remember, we've only proved half this theorem. We've proved if you're not one more than a multiple of four, then you're not a sum of two squares. 
We haven't proved that the ones that are one more than multiple really are. So there's some work to do there. Once you've proved Fermat's theorem, it turns out that you could kind of use that and the fact that all of, every number can be factorized as a product of primes to pick out which numbers are sums of two squares and which aren't. So I'm not going to write down a precise statement because it's slightly fiddly, but what you do is you take your number, you find its prime factorization, and then you look at primes that are one more than a multiple of four and primes that are three mul multiple of four and think about how many of them there are. So it turns out that understanding the problem for primes gets you a long way towards understanding the, the whole result. Okay, so we can classify which numbers are sums of two squares and which aren't. That's kind of nice. Uh, what should we do now? Well, as mathematicians, we don't sort of pack our bags and go home and say, well, that's it, we finished the problem. We say, well, let's try to generalize. Can we adapt what we've done? Can we alter the problem slightly? Can we use the knowledge and extend it somehow? So one way we might try to do that is to say, well, what happens if we have three squares? So what I've got here is the blue numbers are our familiar sums of two squares, and then the yellow numbers are all of the extra things that I can make if I allow myself to add three squares. So remember, for me, zero is a square, so anything that's a sum of two squares is automatically a sum of three squares. But all of a sudden, we've got a whole load of bonus numbers that we can write as sums of three squares, but that weren't sums of, four square, uh, of two squares. So what's going on here? Well, it looks as though we've filled in quite a lot of gaps, actually. It looks as though we've filled in the three column and the six column. It looks as though we've filled in quite a lot of the other sort of Mysterious gaps. Seven columns still looking pretty sad. Nothing in the seven columns so far seems to be a sum of three squares. Poor old seven column. Um, and then there are a few numbers in the four column, actually, that aren't. If you look very carefully, and there isn't very much evidence for this here, the numbers in the four column that aren't sums of three squares are, in fact, four times the numbers in the seven column. So, 28 is 4 times 7, 60 is 4 times 15, 92 is 4 times 23. That's not a coincidence. There are no coincidences in mathematics. If you think you see a thing that looks like a coincidence, that means there's something going on that you should try to explain. So it turns out that what we're seeing here isn't misleading us. The seven column really is empty. We can see that because if I add three things that are 0, 1, or 4 more than a multiple of 8, I never get 7. I'm not going to test all the cases now because it's difficult to do standing in front of lots of people. But you can check it for yourself and convince yourself that you can't get seven that way. So that column really is empty. The fact that we can fill in lots of other things and there are still a few gaps, that takes more work. But it turns out that what we're seeing here somehow is representative, that the seven column and the things that are four times the seven column really aren't sums of three squares and the others are. So this is great. I've got the rest of this talk sorted out. How long have I got? Great. So we can add three squares. We can add four squares, five squares. Right, that's it. So let's keep going. Um, you don't know whether I'm joking, do you? Uh, so let's think about sums of four squares. Let's see what else we get. We expect to get some more numbers, right? There are probably some things that are sums of four squares. We want sums of three squares, and then we can see where the gaps are and keep playing. So oh, there are the sums of four squares. My plan for this talk is sort of failing because it looks like I filled in all the gaps already. Um, so sums of five squares is not going to be very interesting if all of these numbers are already sums of four squares. It does look as though, if I'm allowed four squares, I fill in the seven column and those other pesky little gaps. So this is obviously just because I've got the numbers right from one to 96, right? I'm, I'm, it's very misleading when there are a very large number of numbers in the world and I'm only showing you the first 96. So we haven't got very much information to go on. But it can't possibly be the case that every number in the world is a sum of four squares, right? That would just be silly. But actually, it's true. Every positive whole number is a sum of four squares. I continue to find this kind of surprising because it's so obviously not true. I mean, every positive whole number can be written as a sum of four squares. That's not surprise you, it surprises me. So, theorem of Lagrange. So, Lagrange crops up in all sorts of places. He did some number theory, but he also did work in celestial mechanics and all sorts of other things. Um, but when he wasn't sorting out the movement of the planets, he was showing that every positive number is a sum of four squares, which is great. Um, so, you know, we can pack our bags and go home. Except, except we're mathematicians. We don't pack our bags and go home. We say, well, let's generalize. 
We don't want to generalize by adding more squares, because if everything's a sum of four squares, then everything's a sum of five squares and six squares. This is really boring. So let's generalize in a different direction. What could we do? Uh, well, one thing we could do is say, well, why squares? We could try playing around with cubes or fourth powers, or fifth powers, or seventeenth powers, right? There's, there's lots of scope for generalization there. My, my talk is looking okay again. Um, and we're not the first people to think of this. So here is a picture of Waring, Cambridge mathematician, who is the Lucasian professor of mathematics in Cambridge. And I like to imagine that he was kind of doing what we were just doing. He was reading about this sum of four squares, discovering that every number is a sum of four squares, thinking, oh, well, what happens if we try cubes or fourth powers? And Waring was working in the 18th century, so he couldn't go to Wikipedia or Wolfram Alpha or whatever else and say, tell me which things are sums of cubes. He got out his pen and paper or whatever he was using, and he did some calculations. And as a result of his calculations, he made this fantastic conjecture that every positive whole number is a sum of nine cubes, or 19 fourth powers, and so on. And so on. What does and so on mean? <laughs> this is brilliant, right? Nine cubes, 19 fourth powers, and so on. Yeah, obviously, you yeah. know. I don't know what the, how this, you know, how does this continue? How does this sequence continue? This is not obvious to me. So, mathematicians are, are charitable people. We, we call this Waring's conjecture, Waring's problem. But really, we have to turn this into kind of a proper math statement. This is a little bit woolly at the moment. So before we try to prove something, we need to be clear what it is we're trying to prove. So here's a way of turning this and so on into a precise statement. So deep breath. For any k greater than or equal to 2, there's some s which may depend on k such that every positive integer can be written as a sum of s kth powers. Great. Let me, let me help you with that. So k, we're thinking about the powers. So, so far we've thought about the case when k is equal to 2, when we were squares, but we might try k as 3 cubes, k as 4 fourth powers. And what this says is, we fix our powers. We say, let's talk about cubes. There's some number, which Waring conjecture was 9, so that every positive whole number can be written as a sum of 9 cubes. Or if we're playing with fourth powers, Waring says 19 will do, that every positive whole number could be written as a sum of 19 fourth powers. And so on, we interpret to mean there's some number so that every positive whole number is a sum of that many kth powers, but you're allowed to choose the number depending on what k is. So we're allowed to have four for the squares, which we already know as works, and then nine for the cubes, 19 for the fourth power. So we're not making a prediction about how this sequence 4, 9, 19 continues. We're just saying there's some number that works. So Waring made this conjecture in the 18th century, and then mathematicians thought about it a bit, and then they thought about it a bit more. And then David Hilbert came along, great German mathematician, and in the very early part of the 20th century, he solved Waring's problem. He proved that conjecture. He proved that you really can write every number as sum of so many case powers. So great, that's the end of Waring's problem. Um, but actually, it's not really the end of Waring's problem at all. Uh, so Hilbert had this fantastic, ingenious, clever proof. Um, but then, a few years later, two more mathematicians came along and gave another proof. And you might be thinking, what's the point of being the second person to prove a theorem? That's like being the second person to invent the wheel. You know, big deal. Um, but actually, being the second person to prove a theorem could be really quite a big deal because sometimes the second proof is the one that helps you see what's going on or gives you a different insight into the problem or shows you that this problem is connected to this other problem or gives you a technique that can be implied more generally or all sorts of reasons why the second proof or the third proof or the fourth proof or the fifth proof or the sixth <laughs> proof could be at least as important as the first proof. So what did these people do? They said, well, let's take Waring's problem, just phrase it in a very slightly different way. So... We fixed k. We're talking about kth powers. So if you like, think about k as 3. We think about cubes. We want to know there's some number so that every positive whole number is a sum of that many cubes. So what we're trying to do is show that 
we can always solve an equation like this. So if we're taking k is 3, wearing reckons on the basis of his calculations, we should be able to take s is 9. So we should be able to find a solution to the equation, whatever n is, this equation, n is x1 cubed plus x2 cubed plus x3 cubed plus x4 cubed plus x5 cubed plus x6 cubed plus x7 cubed plus x8 cubed plus x9 cubed. That's a very good tongue twister. So what we'd like to show is that for each n we pick, there's some solution to that equation. Of course, we need these solutions to be positive whole numbers. A bit of a silly game if we're allowed any old numbers. So Hilbert said, yep, I can do that. I can show there's a solution. Uh, no idea how to find one or anything like that, but just, yeah, I can show there is one. But then these two other guys came along, and their idea was, let's answer a harder problem. So rather than just trying to show that there is a solution, let's try to count all of the solutions. If we can count all of the solutions and show the number of solutions is positive, there's definitely at least one. So this is obviously a silly idea, because it must be harder to count the number of solutions to an equation than to show there's at least one. But nonetheless, that was their plan. So our idea is let's try to count the number of solutions to this equation. So who were the, the people who came up with this plan? They were Hardy and Littlewood. Um, so two of the leading British mathematicians of the, the first part of the 20th century. I'm sorry this isn't a fantastic picture of them. Um, that I think... If you look at their dates, you will see they didn't have enough megapixels in their camera or something. Um, but I'm very fond of this picture. It, it shows them in Cambridge, and the view behind them hasn't really changed. Um, I know exactly where it is, so I recognize it. So Hardy and Little came along, and they said, OK, what we're going to do is we've got this equation, and we're going to count the number of solutions to the equation, and then that will show us that there's at least one solution, and then we'll have got another proof of wearing's problem. But by the way, actually, not only will we have another proof of Waring's problem, but we'll have got more information because we'll be able to tell you how many solutions there are to the equation. Okay? So, how do they go about doing this? Well, here's their theorem. Here's what they proved. This is the number of solutions to the equation. So we need there to be enough summands. We know that we need there to be enough cubes that we're adding together. But then, once, as long as you've got that, as long as S is big enough, this is the number of solutions. I put that up to scare you. Actually, I want to properly scare you, so I want to tell you what this curly S of N, the sort of weird squiggly thing in the middle is a sort of gothic S. Um, so let me expand that for you. Here's the curly S of N. This is good, right? You see, we all started very gently, thought, yeah, this is fine, I know about prime numbers. <laughs> So, let me, let me ignore this curly S of N for a moment. Let's talk about this formula. Let me try to help you make sense of this a bit. So, the way to think of this formula is that it comes in two parts, and they're separated by a plus sign. So, there's the stuff before the plus sign, and there's the stuff after the plus sign. And the stuff before the plus sign is the main term, and the stuff after the plus sign is the error term. So, the way to think about this is the main term is really this is how many solutions we think there are, and then the error term is, and there's some junk. Now, I'm a pure mathematician. I like really, really precise statements and proofs. And here's an error term with a load of junk. Might not seem like a very precise statement. It might not seem like it has very precise proof. But this is a very precise error term. This big O notation means this error term is at worst as big as the thing in brackets. So the error term grows at most as fast as this power of n. And what's really important about that power of n is that it's a very slightly smaller power of n than the one that occurs in the main term. So the main term, we've got n to the s over k minus 1. The error term, we've got n to the s over k minus 1 minus a little bit more. So if you think about this, I ignore the s and the k for a moment. If I told you that the main term was grew like n squared and the error term grew like n, I think we'd all agree that when n is really, really large, n squared is much more important than n, right? n squared is massively bigger than n for n a very large number, like a million or a billion or a trillion or something. If I told you the main term was like n squared and the error term was like n to the 1.9, still be true that 
when n is really large, the n squared bit is the important bit, and the n to the 1.9 is sort of a small error term. So that's the kind of way to think about this. We think about the error term as somehow growing less quickly than the main term, and what we're thinking about is n is really large here. So when n is really small, we can deal with it separately. We don't need to worry about n really small. We need to worry about all of the infinitely many very large n's. So what this is saying is the number of solutions is this error term, or this main term, plus an error term that we can sort of ignore. Because what Hardy and Little have realized is when they count the number of solutions to this equation, they don't need to know that the answer is precisely this. They're trying to show that the number of solutions is positive. So if they can show that the number of solutions is this positive main term, at worst, minus some quite small error term that can't possibly mess us up, you still get a positive number of solutions. So it's sort of surprising if you start off doing number theory expecting to be doing nice, clean things with whole numbers to find yourself talking about these main terms and error terms and approximations, but it's all done very precisely. What's going on in the main term? So the way to think about the main term is there's this power of n, the n to the s over k minus 1, and that's really the important bit. And then the other stuff is because actually some numbers are harder to write as sums of powers than others. So some numbers can, we can write as a sum of four squares in lots of different ways. Some numbers we can write as a sum of four squares in only a few ways. Kind of for this, are they in the one column or the two column or the four column kind of reasoning. So what this singular series, the scary curly S of N thing, is somehow encoding is this idea that some numbers are easier to write as sums of powers than others, and it sort of depends on the remainders when you divide by different things, but actually you have to divide by every possible thing and think about the remainder. I love this singular series. This is fantastic. We have got, for this nice, clean, precise problem about whole numbers, infinite series. We've got E, the base of natural logarithms. We've got pi, nice thing about ratios of diameters of circles and stuff. We've got i, that's the square root of minus 1, that's a complex number. Uh, and that's all sort of bundled up, and that's telling us something about the number of solutions to an equation. So for me, this is one of the things that I find really exciting about this part of mathematics, is that it's no good me thinking, well, I want to understand stuff about positive whole numbers, so I'll study positive whole numbers really well. I have to know stuff about e and pi and i and infinite sums and all of those other bits from other areas of mathematics to combine together to answer the problem I was really interested in about positive whole numbers. And the important thing about this singular series is that it's positive. So the, the main term really is a positive thing. I haven't told you about the bit right at the beginning with this gamma, this sort of angle bracket thing, so a Greek letter, capital gamma. So this is the gamma function, which is sort of what you get when you take factorials and you try to join up the factorial function so you can define it for things that aren't integers, and you try to join it up in a sensible kind of way. So this is all very vague, but I'm not expecting you to understand the details of this. Um, I gave a lecture course on this in Cambridge to graduate students a couple of years ago, and we spent 12 hour long lectures doing this stuff, and I think you might have to go home this evening or something. Um, so we won't do all of that. How can you possibly go about getting a formula like that to count the number of solutions to a perfectly friendly looking equation. How can something so apparently complicated involving all of these other things possibly appear? Well, that would be several of the 12 lectures, so I'm not going to do all of that, but I'll just hint at it. So I've reminded you the equation up there we're trying to solve is n is this sum of k powers, and here's a way of writing the number of solutions to that equation in a much more complicated way. So now I've managed to get e pi and i in there and an integral. So don't worry if you haven't met integration, the, the sort of squiggly long s on the, the left-hand side and the d theta on the right-hand side telling us this is an integral. Don't panic if you haven't met integration. It doesn't matter for the purposes of what I'm saying now. It's an idea from calculus. So the way to think about this, if you haven't met integration, is for every single theta between 0 and 1, not just whole numbers, there aren't very many of them, and that all of the thetas between 0 and 1, we work out this quantity and we add them up. And if you're feeling slightly squeamish about the idea of adding up infinitely many of these quantities, that's good. You should feel squeamish. That's why you have to go and learn about integral calculus. How can this integral possibly count solutions 
for that equation? Well, the thing that really makes it work is this excellent fact. So if you have a meta-integration, an e and pi and i and things, don't worry. If you have, you can check that I think this is a very complicated way of saying if m is 0, then this thing is 1, and if not, then it's 0. So it's a very complicated way of sort of indicating whether or not m is 0. And what I can do is the big brackets in the top equation, there's a sum, that capital sigma, all raised to the power s. So I write out my sum s times next to each other and multiply them together. That's what that means. And if I do that with different variables, so I can't have n s times, so I have to have n1 and n2 and so on, n s. And then I've got this e to the minus 2 pi i n theta on the end. That, you can sort of rewrite, that is n minus the thing on the right-hand side of that equation. So what I'm really trying to count is the number of times that n minus x1 to the k plus x2, sorry, minus x2 to the k and so on is zero, and that's what this integral does. And I'm very happy if you didn't understand that. That's okay. If you did, that's even better. But it turns out there's this brilliant idea that we can use integration to get an expression for the number of solutions to this equation. And then we can use lots of clever maths tools to estimate this integral. And it turns out that you have to distinguish between two types of behavior. There are some types of theta where you get important bits in this integral, and there are some kinds of theta where you get very small contributions, and they sort of pile up in the error term. We do lots of estimation. We don't have to compute this integral exactly. Anytime it looks difficult, the motto is approximate. So if it starts looking difficult, you say, OK, that looks difficult. Well, it's about this, and the error term is at most this big. And I'm really careful to keep track of how big the error term is so that I can pile it up in the error term at the end and know that I've still got it under control. So that's a little hint of how some of these ideas can help us um, answer these problems in number theory. Why, why am I excited about Hardy and Littlewood's approach? Why have I told you about that rather than Hilbert's? Well, Hardy and Littlewood's approach gives us more information about the problem. It gives us more understanding of which numbers are hard to write as sums of powers and so on. But it also turns out to be applicable to other problems. So you can take Hardy and Littlewood's ideas and say, well, what about sums of other things instead of kth powers? For example, what about sums of primes? We were interested in sums of primes half an hour ago or whenever it was. And... Uh, a few years after Hardy and Littlewood published their work on sums of kth powers, this Russian mathematician, Vinogradov, came along and said, ah, oh, this is fantastic, because I can take Hardy and Littlewood's ideas and I can combine them with my own really clever work on prime numbers, and I can show that every sufficiently large odd number can be written as the sum of three primes. So that's a result of the flavor of the Goldbach conjecture. If you think about it on the bus home, I hope you will convince yourselves that if the Goldbach conjecture is true, that's the one that says that every even number is a sum of odd, two odd primes, if that's true, then Vinogradov's result follows straight away. But Vinogradov's result doesn't imply the Goldbach conjecture straight away. So Vinogradov do what mathematicians do all the time, which is they say, here's this fantastically exciting research problem. I'd love to solve this. I'll spend some time thinking about that. Oh, gosh, it turns out to be quite difficult. I'll find a slightly easier problem that's sort of related and work on that instead. And actually, that's how mathematics makes progress often, by people solving these slightly easier problems and then eventually managing to sneak up on the big problem. So if you get stuck on your, your maths problems, I recommend this strategy of finding a slightly easier problem to work on. So this is what Vinogradov did. He said, oh, I can't quite prove Goldbach using this technique, but look, I can prove this slightly weaker result. So every sufficiently large odd number means from some point on, every odd number. So that point might be a million or a billion or a squillion, who cares? I mean, from some point on, every odd number is a sum of three primes. And there are only finitely many others that we haven't worried about, and you know, who cares anyway? So this is one example of how Hardy and Littlewood's ideas have been adapted. Actually, there have been a lot of uses of Hardy and Littlewood's ideas since this, um, their work and since Vinogradov's work on these problems or related problems Waring's problem still isn't quite sorted out. So natural question to ask is, well, how many copies of these kth powers do I really need to add together? Do I really need nine cubes? Do I really need 19 fourth powers? How many seventh powers do I need? So those kinds of questions are still topics of current mathematical research, as are questions about, can we take these sort of hardy little circle method, as it's known, and apply it to other things? <coughs> 
So I want to say just a tiny bit about recent developments. And I thought about writing something on this slide, and I was worried that if I did, it would be out of date by the time I got to the talk, because this summer, there's been really exciting developments on a couple of the things that I've talked about. So one of them is this theorem of Vinogradov. So Vinogradov says every sufficiently large number can be written as the sum of three primes. So in theory, you say, well, we'll work out what sufficiently large means. So from a squillion onwards, every odd number is the sum of three primes. So we'll just get the computer to check all the odd numbers from one to a squillion. Well, not one, but from small numbers up to a squillion and check they're all the sum of th three odd primes. Um, and it turns out that a squillion is a very large number and you can't get a computer to check up to a squillion. Uh, Kratlov certainly couldn't do it, even with computers now, can't get up to a squillion. Except, except that this summer, uh, Harold Helfgott, building on work by various other people, found all sorts of clever ways to make squillions smaller and smaller, and to get computers better and better at checking all the numbers up to a squillion. So there was some clever maths to make squillion kind of not too ridiculously big, and then get a friend with a very large computer and some very clever maths to check all of the numbers up to there. So as of this summer, we know that every odd number bigger than whatever it is to be sensible, seven or something, is a sum of three odd primes. So this is an improvement on Vidigradov's work. The other exciting recent development is on the twin prime conjecture, which I mentioned right at the beginning. So I don't know if any of you sorted out that exercise yet? No? All right. Um, so the twin prime conjecture was the one that said there are infinitely many pairs of primes that differ by just two. And as of this summer, the exciting news came out that there are infinitely many pairs of primes that differ by at most 70 million. <laughs> and you're sitting there thinking, but 70 million is a very big number. And I'm standing here thinking 70 million is a very small number compared with infinity. 70 million was the first number that was properly known any results of the form, there are infinitely many pairs of primes that differ by at most. So a person called Zhang, mathematician called Zhang, put out this paper and said, look, I can show there are infinitely many pairs of primes that differ by at most 70 million. At which point the mathematical community seized on this and said, wouldn't it be lovely if we could make 70 million a bit smaller? And the mathematical community is a very international community. It's now helped enormously by the internet. So what happened was a bunch of mathematicians set up a collaborative project online via blogs and wikis. It's all there in public. You can go home and look it up, Google it. Um, working on, let's look at Zhang's ideas and let's see whether we can just work a little bit harder to optimize this here and use this clever idea from this other research paper here and see what we can do with 70 million. And I haven't written anything here because the news you know, keeps changing on what the, the latest best value of 70 million is. Um, so I had a quick look earlier, and it looks as though it's down to six digits, maybe five digits. So you can go and check. There's a table, there's a league table, where these mathematicians working on this project say, look, we can do 70 million, that's Zhang's work. Well, look, I can do this change, I can make this tweak, now we can do slightly better. Oh, yes, okay, now I've got that idea, I can do this. So it's all there in public. You can go and see real mathematicians working on this, it's all there. Um, this work is not going to make 70 million into two. This is not going to prove the twin prime conjecture. I don't think that anybody seriously thinks that with the ideas of Zhang's paper, they're going to prove the twin prime conjecture. They can get a lot closer than anybody's done before. But that's okay, you can relax, because there's still a few more days for you to go home and prove the twin prime conjecture for yourselves. Um, I hope that's given you a flavor of why I find number theory addictive. I should just say one other thing about the title, because I stole it. Um, there's a fantastic number theory textbook called An Introduction to the Theory of Numbers by Hardy and Wright. It's a classic. That's the same Hardy as in Hardy and Littlewood I showed you a picture earlier. And a few years ago, I needed to go and look up a reference in Hardy and Wright. So I went to the maths department library in Cambridge. We're very fortunate to have a very good library. And I was very excited to find there was a new edition of Hardy and Wright there. So it's a very old book now. Um, it's been updated by um, so the, a couple of the, the world's leading number theorists now, so they've updated it, fixed a few things, added in some of the new work. Um, there's a foreword by Andrew Wiles, who proved Fermat's last theorem, explaining um, how useful he'd found this book, how influential he'd found the book. So I sat there and I read his foreword, and I read the preface to the new edition, and then I kept turning the pages, and I kept getting the prefaces to earlier and earlier editions, until I got back to 
Hardy and Wright's original preface to the first edition of their introduction to the theory of numbers, which is where they set out what they're trying to do in the book and you know, what they've included and what they haven't included and who it's for and all that. And they explain that there are some chapters on the algebraic theory of numbers, and there are some chapters on the analytic theory of numbers, and there are some chapters on the addictive theory of numbers. I thought, well, that's nice. I wonder whether that's what Hardy and Wright actually wrote. Um, and as I say, we have a very good library, so I got the first edition. It was sitting there on the shelf. And I pulled out the first edition, and I looked at the preface to the first edition by Hardy and Wright, and they explained that there are some chapters on the algebraic theory of numbers, and there are some chapters on the analytic theory of numbers, and there are some chapters on the additive theory of numbers. <laughs> But really, addictive, theory seemed, uh, addictive number theory seemed to me like much too good a phrase to waste. So I hope you won't mind my uh, pinching it. Thank you very much. Um, what's your favorite result in number theory and why? My favorite result in number theory. And why? That's really difficult. You know, I, I want my Desert Island 8 favorite results in number theory. And I think I've just told you about most of them, actually. Um, the thing that I, a, a common theme amongst thing, the results I like in number theory is that they arise from quite simple questions, quite natural questions. But in the process of finding an answer to the problem of proving the theorem, you discover something quite deep about the structure of the mathematics. So I think that's kind of common theme of the kinds of things that I've been showing you today and some of my other favorite results. What's the significance of the uh, two pi in your big summation? Yeah, the two pi. The two pi crops up not really by itself as two pi. It crops up as two pi i. So Isn't that just the same as just i? If you have the e to the i, then surely you just goes straight round. Yeah, there's, there's a 2 or pi i multiplied by some other stuff in there as well, though. So you're right, it's sort of all happening in the complex plane, and it's all about how far I'm moving round. And you're exactly right that it's to do with those kind of angles in the complex plane. But the crucial thing is that I've got e to the 2 pi i times some other stuff. And sometimes that other stuff turns out to be 0, and e to the 2 pi i times 0 is just e to the 0 to 1. Sometimes it's something slightly different. But it's all to do with kind of working in the complex plane and thinking about the directions of these vectors and when things cancel out. So sometimes the sum is quite small because you've got lots of complex numbers sort of in different directions that cancel each other out. Whereas sometimes you've got lots of complex numbers in the complex plane, but they all sort of point in the same direction and they add up and they give you a really big sum. So I'm sorry that doesn't really answer your question, but I think I need a bit longer on a piece of paper to give you a really proper answer. It was just basically to sort out personal discussion between uh, me and a colleague. I'm not sure I want to resolve a dispute. Well, that feels like a very dangerous position whether, for me to be in. It was just about whether or not you could confirm to us the wearing number for fifth powers. No, not off the top of my head. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> I'm afraid. Um, there's actually two interesting questions. So there's the question of how many fifth powers do I need to allow myself, allow myself to make every positive whole number? And... The answer to that question is known, but it's sort of known for rubbish reasons, because if I take a number like, what's 2 to the power 5? I think 2 to the power 5 is 32. If I take a number like 31, I need to add 31, have 31 fifth powers to add together to make it, because the only fifth power I can use is 1 to the 5. So there's a sort of rubbish reason why I need 31 fifth powers just because there aren't very many small fifth powers. So somehow the, the morally right question is, if I'm only going to talk about every sufficiently large number, how many fifth powers do I need to write every sufficiently large number as a sum of fifth powers? Nobody knows. So there are estimates. You could say you need at least this many, and this many will do, and there's a gap. Nobody knows. That's exercise three. Um, how do we determine um, what, what is a sufficiently large number? So is it to determine or to disclude trivial solutions, or is it for a more underlying reason? So these results like Vinogradov's every sufficiently large number, blah, 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 sometimes the proof, you can go through the proof really carefully and discover that the proof says, well, you need the number to be at least this big, and then you get further and discover actually you need it to be a bit bigger. You can go through the proof really, really carefully and work it out, 
and then you discover that this number will do. It might be that a much smaller number will do, but your proof doesn't allow it. Um, sometimes the nature of the proof means actually you can't put value on it. You can say, I know that it is the case that from some point on this will be true, but you can't put a value on it. And sometimes you just don't bother putting a value on it because you know the value is going to be rubbish and really that's not the point. You know, you're going to get some ridiculously large number. You know that's not really the answer to the problem and the fact that it's some very large number doesn't really tell you very much. So why bother going through the proof very carefully, keeping track because it's not really going to tell you anything. 